Back in 1909, the Lake Superior and Ishpeming Railway, or LSNI, also, if I'm mispronouncing Ishpeming, I am doing my best here, don't yell at me. Someone in the comments be like, it's actually Ishpeming or something ridiculous. Anyway, they were planning to sell off four of their older steam locomotives and replace them with new 280 consolidations. They would wind up ordering five new C5 class consolidations from Alco, and they were constructed at their Pittsburgh works in 1910 at a cost of $14,335 each. Number 18 was one of these original C5s, the third one to be precise. Though her original number was actually 11, at the time she pulled mixed freight trains and sometimes iron ore trains alongside her sister locomotives. Admittedly, she wasn't actually a top tier engine when she was introduced. She was prone to stalling, but to be fair, that was usually when the train was too heavy or when she was climbing a grade. Eventually the railway, LS and I would merge with the Munising Marquette and Southeastern Railway, MM and SC, and that was when she was renumbered to 18. And in 1930, she was rebuilt and modified at the Presque Isle shops. These rebuilds were also given to most of her sisters, and it involved their boilers receiving superheaters, as well as being raised higher above the frame. Their fireboxes were also widened and given Nicholson thermic siphons. Their cylinder saddles were replaced entirely by ones with superheated cylinders and piston valves, and they were also given feed water heaters. These upgrades boosted their tractive effort, and they were reclassified as SC4s. Following her upgrades, she was reassigned mostly to pulling logging trains on branch lines, as well as to switch hopper cars out at iron ore mines. And by the end of the 1950s, 18 of her sisters were stationed at Ishpeming and Nagani, which I'm also mispronouncing. There's a lot of words I'm gonna ruin in this video, I'm so excited. The railroad at the time decided to keep a few steam locomotives on their roster, since they were useful for thawing frozen iron ore at ore docks during the bitterly cold winter months in that area. Though they did retire most of their steam fleet and replace them with diesels like pretty much everyone else did. Number 18, and the last few of her sisters, managed to last until 1962, when the railroad discontinued any and all commercial steam operations. However, fate favored number 18 and her sisters, as by the 1960s, the preservation movement in America had ramped up quite a bit. And in August of 1963, number 18 and 11 of her sisters were purchased by the newly formed Marquette and Huron Mountain Tourist Railroad. The owner of that line, John A. Zerbel, was eager to use the locomotives to pull summer tourist trains on former LSNI trackage between Marquette and a proposed resort complex in the Big Bay area. And all of this sounds like a really good idea, but you bought 11? How much overhead we talking? How much money do you have? Cause boy howdy, that all sounds really expensive. And you better hope this new line is really popular. And well, people did ride on it, but it wasn't as promising as their bell probably was hoping. Plans for the resort complex completely fell through and only a few of the other SC4s actually worked on the line, 19, 22, and 23. The rest of them, including number 18, were inoperable and they were left in storage at a nearby field during the operating years of the tourist line. In April of 1984, Zerbel died shortly before a tax deadline. Others involved in the operation tried to continue the tourist line, but eventually they had to permanently close down by the end of the year, and all the remaining equipment was sold at an auction on January 14th, 1985. During that auction, 18, as well as three of her sisters, 19, 20, and 21, were sold to a scrap dealer, the Ishpeming Steel Company for just $1,200 each. This could have spelled the end for all four of them, but upon hearing of this, a man by the name of Art Anderson, who was actually the former chief mechanical officer of Marquette and Huron Mountain, made an effort to save them. He signed a 90-day note of $10,000, which meant that his Peming Steel would keep them on hold, but he would have to pay that note, otherwise they'd be cut up. Fate was in Anderson's favor, however, as well as 18, 19, 20, and 21s. See, a Wisconsin-based entrepreneur, as well as a fellow rail fan, 
John Slack, found out about Anderson's predicament, and he quickly agreed to help out. He was a well-off individual, and $10,000 for four steam locomotives? I mean, if you're the right kind of buyer, that's a steal. With the locomotive safe and in his possession, he made plans to use all four of them to pull dinner trains on another proposed tourist railroad in Leona, Wisconsin. An 18 was actually selected to be restored to operable condition first. His new company, the Lake State Steam Transportation Company, or LSST, hired a man by the name of Gary Bensman, as well as Steve Sandberg, to work on 18. But while restoration work was proceeding, a major contractor involved with the plans terminated their working partnership with Slack's business, and a bank decided to stop funding the project shortly after that. Number 18's fate was again held in the balance. In the late 1980s, under the guidance of Max and Thelma Beigert, a former Santa Fe Railroad line between Williams, Arizona and the Grand Canyon was being redeveloped for tourist operations, to be called the Grand Canyon Railway, or GCR. Their initial goal was to launch steam train operations by April of 1990. Gary Bensman, who by this point had been hired as GCR's chief mechanical officer, and already knew John Slack, entered negotiations with him regarding number 18, since he'd already started mechanical work on her anyway, and it wouldn't be that difficult to finish it. So quickly could he possibly get this done that Max Bygart considered pushing the opening date of his new rail line to September 17th, 1989, which would admittedly be the 88th anniversary of the line's original 1901 completion. And number 18 would be available to pull the first train. Bensman promised Bygart that he and the other crews would make the process work. And in July of 1989, the GCR did purchase number 18 as well as 19 and 20 from Slack. All three of them were loaded onto flat cars and shipped via the Chicago and Northwestern Main Line to Chicago. There was some shipping delays that was actually caused by Chicago and Northwestern. What are you guys doing? Chop, chop, you got one job here. None of them actually arrived in Williams until late August. When number 18 arrived, the crews immediately began working 20 hour shifts to get her restored by the deadline. And sometimes the crew would consist of up to 30 people. A lot of individuals were putting in hard work to bring 18 back up to steam. And the effort involved patching her firebox, installing new air brakes, and a whole bottom part of her tender actually had to be replaced. And she also had to be converted from coal to oil firing. So they had to install an oil tank in her tender to make that work. And a lot of plumbing mechanisms had to be added. In the early morning of September 17th, number 18 was fired up under GCR ownership for the first time. But some test runs had to be conducted before she could pull the inaugural train. And even that didn't go off quite without a hitch. The crews had to use the shutoff valve to control the water in the boiler due to a faulty water pipe and a broken injector. But it was a manageable issue. Number 18 managed to pull the train and she became the first steam locomotive to travel to the Grand Canyon since 1953. Other problems cropped up during her trip though. She suffered some overheated bearings, and that resulted in a late arrival. And her issues also meant she had to stay at a yard in the Grand Canyon village for overnight repairs, and a diesel had to take the train back. But her issues were corrected, and the following day, she was able to pull another passenger train for a return run to Williams. But her problems kept cropping up. Her restoration had been rushed, and I mean really rushed. So for the remaining of the 1989 operating season, she kept suffering mechanical issues. In January of 1990, construction was completed on a shop facility in Williams with air conditioning, as well as various tools that would improve working conditions for the maintenance crews. 18 then went under a major overhaul to resolve the mechanical problems she was suffering from, before she would return to service on March 1st. This seems to have worked, however. The 1990 operating season was actually very good, as she even performed some double headers with another steam locomotive that GCR had acquired and restored, the SC3 class number 29. By early 1991, management was starting to look into ways to try to get people to, like, know about the railway. They felt that advertising was not as strong as it should be. So between February 21st and 22nd, 
Number 18 actually pulled GCR's three car Hase Yampa Special on Santa Fe's main line from Williams to Phoenix. After this was done, she was displayed for two days at the Phoenix Union Station to take part in Phoenix Union Station Days, which was sponsored by the National Association of Railroad Passengers. 18 and the special consist returned to Williams on February 26. This push to spread awareness about the railway actually seems to have worked. By the mid-1990s, popularity was in fact booming for the rail line, but that was increasing the length of their regular trains. And as such, they were starting to exceed number 18's polling power. Remember, she was a consolidation. A modified one, but still a consolidation. She could only really handle six loaded passenger cars unassisted, but she still would stick around for a while yet. In October of 1996, the Grand Canyon chapter of the National Railway Historical Society actually hosted an event that celebrated former Burlington Route 282 number 4960's debut on GCR. And 18 performed a double header with 4960. But in late 2002, 18 had to be taken out of service to undergo her mandatory inspection. Due to her low tractive effort, officials decided not to return her to service. They just had more powerful locomotives and it was really hard to find a place to even use 18. So instead of firing her up again, she was put on display at the Williams Depot, while 29 and 4960 continued to pull the trains. She would be sidelined, sadly, for about five years, seemingly with her excursion career behind her. But by early 2007, a businessman named Brian Fleming had decided he wanted to run a tourist railroad in the Pacific Northwest, and he was originally planning on restoring Spokane, Portland, and Seattle 539, but he knew this was going to be a startup project, after all, he was already a businessman, and a larger locomotive, 539 is a Mikado, would therefore be more expensive. So he felt that maybe looking into getting a small steam engine first, that would be cheaper to run, might be a better choice until his railroad really got going. So he contacted GCR and asked if they were just willing to sell number 18. After all, she was just sitting there. GCR was receptive to the idea. I'm sure they would have kept running 18 if they had had the room for her, but why spend the money if you aren't gonna use her, you know? But Fleming did want to restore her and run her, so they reached a deal in April of 2007, where GCR would trade 18 as well as number 20 in exchange for 539, and Fleming was to pay all the shipping costs involved in the trade. 18 was scheduled to enter service for Fleming's Mount Hood Railroad, or MHRR, which was located in Oregon by July 4th. But she almost went up in smoke even before that happened. While she and her sister were being loaded, a cutting torch actually started a fire on a flat car that was carrying number 18. But fortunately, this was quickly put out and she suffered no damage as a result. They were supposed to go by train, appropriately, via Union Pacific, but they had clearance issues while they were routing the shipment. And it took over one month to get 18 and 20 to where they needed to be. You pee. You pee, you got, what is happening? Why are you like this? Like, this is why people use trucks. Y'all need to be better around here, I'm just saying. But they did arrive either way. On June 8th, 18 was unloaded onto MHRR's rails and crews there immediately began working to restore her to service. The Federal Railroad Administration performed an internal inspection of her boiler and found that the tubes had to be replaced, which wasn't exactly a surprise. And a June 22nd hydrostatic test did reveal minor leaks that also needed repairs. But on July 6, 18 underwent her first test fire under MHRR ownership, and she performed her first test runs on the line six days after that. And beginning on July 18th, she pulled the railroad's tourist trains throughout the Hood River Valley. But while Fleming has seemed like a reasonable businessman so far, he wound up overestimating the ridership turnout for his new line and underestimated fuel costs. Number 18 pulled her last train for the railroad just over a month after first starting on August 31st, before she was sidelined and they discontinued steam operations entirely. While this was going on, the Rio Grande Scenic Railway which was under the guidance of businessman Ed Ellis and his company, Iowa Pacific Holdings, was actually operating tourist trains on the San Luis and Rio Grande freight main line in Colorado. And they utilized one steam locomotive, Southern Pacific 1744. They were interested in expanding their roster, so 18 and 20 were again sold, purchased by the RGSR, 
and they were shipped again to Alamosa, Colorado. Beginning in 2008, while 1744 had to undergo heavy boiler repairs, 18, who remember had just been restored to operation, pulled the RGSR's excursion and photographer trains on the SLRG's La Vida Pass between Alamosa and La Vida. She handled the role well, but she last operated under their ownership in 2013 when she was put into storage. Within the ensuing years, Iowa Pacific Holdings and the SLRG were actually running into very bad financial troubles and had mounting debt. In 2017, the SLRG took out a $5 million loan from an investment firm in Illinois to try to fix their problems, but they subsequently defaulted and then created a grand total of $4.6 million in debt. That is, that is peak Penn Central energy. Top tier. Good work, guys. In September 2019, the SLRG filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and the RGSR and all the equipment, which included 18, were put into receivership via equipment dealer Ozark Mountain Railcar. But Hope isn't lost for number 18. In fact, you may see her again quite soon. On March 27th, 2021, the Colbertdale Railroad announced that they were planning on working to acquire number 18. She was subsequently shipped from Alamosa to their location in Boyertown, Pennsylvania, and their crews began to work on her. Her flu time expired in 2022, so she does need to go through another mandatory inspection before running again. The latest news from the company's website does show that they possess two steam locomotives, 18, as well as Grand Trunk Western, number 5030. However, it doesn't look like either one is currently operational, as the only rides they offer involve a diesel locomotive. But hopefully, soon, number 18 will ride the rails again, and considering it feels like she's done nothing but wander, like an old school railway hobo over here, I just really hope this is her final home, you know? The poor girl deserves it. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, and Zach A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Aurora Videos, Lord Off 444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Royal Hunter 2860, Isofer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleepy Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Joshua Long, Andrew Bowen, Dr. Racer 78, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGrow, Travis Delinsky, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Trenton, and Master of None. Until next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.